Today's episode has been brought to you by Schedulicity. Welcome to episode 91 of the Connected Yoga Teacher Podcast. What would it be like to talk with a hundred yoga teachers and find out what their challenges are and what they have learned so far? Mado Hesselink took on that exact project. She wanted to increase the work that she was doing with yoga teachers, and so she decided to dig in and personally talk to 100 yoga teachers. Today, I wanted to ask her to share what she learned in those conversations and how it has impacted the work that she does. If you are a regular listener, thank you so much for your continued support. It means a lot. And it means a lot when you reach out and you leave a review in iTunes. I try to read every single one of them here on the podcast. So a huge shout out to Blondie6599 from the United States. Here's the thing. If you guys leave your name, I can read your name. Otherwise, I'm reading your iTunes handle. Is it like your Apple handle? I'm not sure. Anyway, if you feel like, why didn't she say my name? It's That's what I get is your kind of handle. So you can always leave it in the comments. Okay, so Blondie6599 from the United States says, I can't get enough of this podcast. I've been brainstorming and trying to figure out how to accomplish my goals. And this podcast is giving me the tools to do that. I've skipped around a little, then started at the beginning, and I'm all in. Thank you, Shannon, for all you do. Well, thank you, Blondie6599. That means a lot. I love that this podcast is helping you with your goals, and I'm curious to know what it was like to skip around and then just start from the beginning. It makes me cringe a little bit because I feel like now that we're into our 91st episode today, I've improved a bit. I hope I have. (laughs) Also, HS. Ducey from Canada said, being a quote unquote new teacher, I find this podcast so helpful on my journey. I discovered so much through this podcast. Highly recommend. Well, thank you, HS Ducey. I am glad that you have found this as a new yoga teacher and it's my goal to continue to support you. So if you think that there's something that we're missing or a topic that we haven't covered yet, let me know. If you are a brand new listener, hi, my name is Shannon Crow. I'm a mom of three, a yoga teacher, and a trainer and consultant for yoga teachers. And this podcast here was created just for you so that you can connect to information, inspiration every single week and feel supported as you navigate the jungles of yoga entrepreneurship. Because I know it isn't easy. (laughs) Have you checked out our show notes yet? Kira Sloan, who was on a previous episode, sent me an email to say that she was impressed by how complete our show notes are. She loved that we linked to everything she talked about in the interview, and I need to give a shout out of thanks to Crunch for this work. She is the one creating our show notes, and you can see how in-depth they are if you go to, say, for instance, this episode is the connectedyogateacher.com slash 91. So you just have to know the episode number and it's the connectedyogateacher.com slash whatever number of episode. There are other resources on our website as well. So check those out. We have online trainings and workshops, articles, and a map. Have you seen the map yet where you can add your contact information and see what yoga teachers are in your area? I think it is super cool. Sometimes if we're traveling, it's nice if we can check out a yoga class with someone who is connected to a community that we know, like the connected yoga teacher community. So if you do connect with someone in person, tell us about it, tag us in the photo. I love to see people connecting in real life. Before I share more, let's hear from Schedulicity. Hello, Connected Yoga Teachers. This is Lisa with the Schedulicity Hot Tip of the Week. Hi, I'm Lisa Suba with Renew Yoga and Massage. I've been a massage therapist, yoga teacher for six years and um, have used Schedulicity from day one of my practice. I like using Schedulicity because it's easy from the marketing perspective. I can email my database, which I do at least monthly. It's easy to get out notices about um, cancellations or if I'm going to be on vacation. 
Uh, I love being able to send out birthday emails, and that's super simple to do by just selecting the birthday for the month. I type in a little paragraph about their birthday, happy birthday, and their discount, and then that goes out to my database where I used to have to handwrite my cards. So I really enjoy that email component that Schedulicity has to offer. Thank you to our entire Schedulicity team. Thank you for your support. I know you guys are busy doing updates and adding things to our scheduling software, and it is so helpful. Alrighty, let's dive in and meet our guest today. Mado has been teaching yoga since 2005 and training yoga teachers since 2010. She is the creator of Yoga Teacher Resource and teaches at yoga teacher trainings around the southeastern United States. Mado is a lighthearted, creative, and very informed yoga teacher who is passionate about anatomy and many other complementary movement modalities. Welcome to the Connected Yoga Teacher Podcast, Mado. It's great to have you here today. Thanks, Shannon. I am super excited that we get to talk finally because you have been working on a really big project of talking to 100 yoga teachers. And I think that's amazing. Before we get into that, I want to hear what what brought you to this place of doing this project first? Uh, great. So let's let's see. So I've been teaching yoga for 13 years and about um I would say 2 years ago when my youngest was about 6 months old I had a, a run in uh, a, an experience with a woman who I now call my fairy godmother business coach. And it was she posted on a local Facebook group saying, I'm kind of a high level person who's had a lot of business experience and I'm, I'm having some personal issues. So I don't want to get into anything that is going to be a big commitment for myself, but I want to put myself out there for really affordable business coaching. And I was like, okay. So she came over and she did two sessions with me. And During those sessions, she gave me two gifts. One is that she forced or pressured or like inspired, but, but it was like, it it took, like I was kind of resistant to it, but she insisted that I had to choose a niche. So she really massaged it out of me of who do you feel most energized when you're teaching? And, you know, what we came to, what I came to understand through my work with her was that it it was the teacher trainings. It was teaching the teachers. It was teaching the people who are so passionate about yoga that they are wanting to teach themselves that that was the environment that made me come alive. Oh, I love it. I love how she worked away on the niche. Do you remember anything that was like a light bulb moment where that she asked a certain question or or moved you into some way of really seeing that niche? Well, I mean, it it was two years ago and I have mom brain. So (laughs) (laughs) I would say not, I mean, you know, what I'm left with is this general impression of it's about the feeling, right? It's about the feeling of what environment do you like suddenly feel like you're alive in? What What environment, you know, of teaching makes you feel excited? Who is it that just, it feels easy to teach, if that makes sense. Like for me, teaching beginners is wonderful in its own way. But if I look at where I feel most alive and, and, and excited and, and easy, it's like easier for me to teach teachers. Right. Oh, I like it that it's a feeling. So she came over and did this with you two years ago. And then, and then what happened? So the second gift she gave me was introducing me to the concept of the lead magnet. And for those of you who aren't familiar with that term, a lead lead magnet is a small gift that you give people for signing up for your email list. And it's not that I'd never heard of it before, but I I hadn't really connected that yoga teachers might do that. Um, 
And so, well, and especially that the lead magnet needed to be connected to my ideal audience, which, you know, we, we teased together out was actually people who either want to teach yoga or already, or are already teaching yoga. Mm -hmm. And then, so what I did is I was already mentoring some yoga teachers, some newer yoga teachers. And I, I kind of asked them because they were members of my ideal audience. I said, what, what would be an, a great lead magnet for you? What would be a great thing that would inspire you to sign up for an email list? And I want to give a shout out to Liz Craig, who was one of my, one of the people I was mentoring at the time. And she was like, oh my gosh, you know, on your website, you have this list of a hundred yoga class themes and you just have it out there just on your website. And I would totally give you my email address for that. And I was like, oh, Okay. So I go and I look on, on my analytics for my website and I start to realize that that is my number one landing page already because, you know, that had been up for maybe five years already or something like that. And organically traffic had built to that page. So it was already the page that people were landing on. (laughs) So I just kind of, you know, massaged the page a little bit to, I took the content down, put it into a PDF form and, you know, but I left up or I kind of re, I had gotten a ton of comments and, you know, like basically testimonials about it. So I made those more front and center and then invited people to sign up for my list. That's fantastic. And I was saying at the very beginning of our conversation, I'll let our listeners in on this, that I saw that years ago. And just when I was going back to your website, looking for the podcast interview, I realized, hey, this is that exact same thing. So I love that you took an existing piece of content and made that as your lead magnet or your thing to get people to sign up for. And it's targeted right towards your audience. So it would be a yoga teacher, really. It's not a yoga student that wants to know 100 yoga class themes. It's a yoga teacher. So I will definitely add a link in the show notes so that people can go and sign up for that. That's fantastic. Thank you. That's awesome. Yeah. And the cool thing is that, you know, for me, it happened kind of organically, but I think other people can do the same thing. They can look at their content that they already have out there and see what's really resonating with people. Mm -hmm. What is getting the most traffic? Oh, yeah. That's a really good idea. Yeah. So then you could either take, you know, if it feels complete already, you could take that or you could just take that theme or that idea or that topic and make a, a, you know, kind of expand it into a lead magnet. Mm Mm-hmm. I have to tell you, just this week, my podcast editor was was saying to me, you know, are you going on different podcasts? And I was like, yes, I am. And and then she said, do you have a lead magnet to go along with that? And I was like, uh, n- not really. I've been really skipping around talking about many different topics. <laughs> and so right. I thought, wow, here is my audio editor, like helping me with my own niching down So I think we can always look at that even in different aspects of our business. That's fantastic. So then this led you to be working with mentoring yoga teachers and you've been working within yoga teacher trainings, did I see, like for the last eight years. That's right. Yep. That's fantastic. And then what led you to think, hmm, I should talk to 100 yoga teachers? (laughs) Um, yeah, that's a valid question. So I, you know, almost immediately this, this, um, this lead magnet was started to build my list. Um, I think my best day was like 80, 80 new signups. Um, because like, I think there was, you know, like moments where it went viral, but at the same time in my personal life, I was, you know, managing being, you know, again, a new mom. I have a a 15 year old biological child and a a stepchild who's 20 also, but I was kind of, you know, going backwards and I had this, this infant and I was also building a house. And so it was a little bit of a time of backing away from building my business and just kind of sustaining for a while. But meanwhile, in the background, this lead magnet was working for me and, and building this list. And just this past January was the moment when I started to peek my head above the trees to, to be like, okay, I think I'm settled. We're, we're now in our new house. It, and um, yeah, it, feel, it felt like um, a transition time of sorts. And I felt ready to, to make a, a plan for going forward. 
And, but I didn't know what that was. It wasn't clear to me where to head next. And so that's why I decided to talk to other yoga teachers. And I didn't want to make it just talking to newer teachers or, you know, just, I just wanted to get a sense of what is out there. What are the concerns? What are the dreams? What's the, what's the environment, the context that people are teaching in to help me figure out how I can be of service? I love that. What made you pick the number 100? That seems like so many phone calls. <laughs> um, you know, honestly, it was, it was just a number that was thrown out there by somebody else. Somebody else had done, you know, in a different industry had done a hundred. Um, and I didn't even connect it to my hundred yoga class themes originally, but now I'm like, Hey, there's, there's some symmetry there. <laughs> there is. And so when you called these yoga teachers, first of all, how did you get the word out there and how did you choose which teachers you would, you would connect with? Well, actually, it was mostly just that email list. So by the time I started this um, this pr uh, project, I had about 3,500 people, 3,500 yoga teachers on that email list. And so I, I mostly just put it out to that list. I did put some, I have a private Facebook group, and so I put it out there. Um, and I think you were gracious enough to let me put it on your Facebook group also. So I got a few people from your Facebook group. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, that was it. It was, it was, I would say 90% from my email list. That's exciting. And I like that you said that you were, you know, doing the mom thing, building a house, all of the busy things of life, but still your lead magnet was drawing those email addresses so that you did have an audience to email to. That's fantastic. Yeah, that was really cool. And I will say one thing, one other thing that happened kind of towards the end of the project that I didn't anticipate. And I wish I had thought of kind of capitalizing on this dynamic earlier. But one person that I spoke with started to forward my email to her friends. And so that her name was Megan Stegman. She's in Chicago. If you're listening, hi, Megan, thank you for doing that. <laughs> um, so she so I ended up with like five people in the Chicago area and then one of them forwarded to some people in Denver. So then I ended up with like five people in Denver. And so if I had, if I, had, if I were to do this over, I'd probably ask the people that I had a really nice conversation with. All of the conversations were wonderful in their own way, but some people were, you know, some, some of them just had a little bit more energy, a more connection to them. And I would have asked those people to, um, to forward it, to, to let their friends know. Cause I didn't, that didn't occur to me, but it, you know, then the people who, um, who signed up because their friend told them to, they like, they were already more open. There were a few people who signed up who were a little bit like, so what are you doing this for? Like kind of, I don't know, maybe feeling like I might try to sell them something or I don't know what it was. Um, but not the people who, whose friends had forwarded to them. Right. Oh, that makes so much sense. Really, we trust the the testimonials from our friends or the, you know, if they say, hey, I bought this thing and it was great, or hey, I signed up for this, or I read this book, we're more apt to read it when our friends suggest it. So word of mouth is a great way to go even for something like this. And so how did you pick out the questions that you would ask these yoga teachers? And do you want to share some of the answers that were surprising to you or um, really made you think or, or ones that you applied into your own yoga practice or yoga teaching? Yeah. So I, when, when I started out, I had some basic questions and I did create a spreadsheet that I, you know, kept track of all the answers in. And the questions, you know, just to be a little bit more organic, I didn't ask them in the same way every time. I would always ask people, but I was, would always start by asking people where they were located because that was this kind of big mystery. I would know their time zone, but I would like, I wouldn't know if I were, if I was calling California or, you know, New Mexico or Canada, you know, I had some <laughs> right. people in Canada. Um, 
and from there, sometimes the conversation would just blossom and I would hardly even ask a question. I would just take notes when they started telling me things that fit with the categories of, of my curiosity. So some of the things I was asking about was, you know, how long have you been teaching? Um, do you have a niche? Do you have a particular style that you specialize in or a population that you specialize in? What was your training like? Where did you train? Who were your teachers? How much training have you had? What, um, what are your biggest challenges? What are your, what's, what is your vision and your goals? And finally, you know, and, and in the beginning I was asking them, what sorts of resources do you wish were out there, but you haven't seen or haven't seen the quality that you're hoping for? Like I was just kind of, and, and I asked that in a lot of different ways, just kind of experimenting. Mm-hmm. At, and then about a third of the way through the project, I had I had in my mind for many years felt like I wanted to start a podcast, but I I didn't have a lot of clarity around how to do that or why I would do it. And so, but but talking to these teachers really inspired me because I started to see these threads, these lines of of overlap in their challenges. And so that made me really inspired to help them. So I, I actually launched a podcast partway through this conversation, (laughs) which you have been a guest on. Yes. And I would love to invite people to come and check out that episode with Shannon. I can't even remember the name of the episode now is, um, let me look it up here. Community over competition was kind of the general thread. How to succeed as a yoga teacher by focusing on cooperation over competition. Yeah. Yeah. Which, you know, is a perfect topic for us because here you were already with your own podcast for yoga teachers and just welcoming me with open arms and, you know, giving, offering me advice. And um, so I'm really grateful for that, Shannon. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Well, I was really excited. I mean, I think there's tons of room. I know that uh, when I first started podcasting and I shared this uh, with Amanda Kingsmith just recently of MBOM. I don't know if you know her podcast, but she does one on the business of yoga. And when I was about to put my podcast out, I went and looked at some podcasts, found hers, and was a little like brokenhearted for a few days, <laughs> thinking, oh my gosh, it's already been done. But then I got talking with Amanda and listening more to her episode. And I realized, you know what, we're both going to have different ways that we have a podcast and and there's lots of room for it there are de- it's limited for yoga teachers to find podcasts that really help them with their business so I was excited to see yours yeah and it's great um it's great also uh I'll for sure share that episode in the show notes because I know that there's a different element to when you're interviewed on someone else's podcast they're asking all of the questions so yeah I'm happy that we could trade then today. Plus, I yeah. have a, a, I have a hundred questions about your hundred. <laughs> so, what felt like it was the most surprising thing that you were hearing in that in those hundred con- conversations, or what really stuck with you? Wow. Okay. <laughs> There's a lot, um, but um, you you talked about surprising, so I'm going to start with that. There was a few things that surprised me, and they kind of they kind of go into two themes. One thing that surprised me is that the happiest yoga teachers that I spoke with are not trying to make a living teaching. Or they have found some creative way to to offer their teaching that isn't the expected model of running from studio to studio teaching um, you know, a dozen classes a week. The people that I talk to who are doing that, they are really clear that that's not sustainable and they're looking for a better way. Um, you know, some of the happiest people that I spoke with are the, like the 70 somethings who are retired and they're purely teaching yoga for the joy of sharing yoga. And I, and I spoke with quite a few of those. That um, sends, I I think that's amazing in that I think that someone who's in their 70s would have a lot so much life wisdom to add to the teachings of yoga. 
Yeah. And one of the life wisdoms is, uh, I'm, I'm not interested in striving to be famous or I'm not interested in striving to, to make this a business. I, I just want to share yoga. I recorded a podcast already about the difference between teaching yoga full-time and part-time and how teaching yoga part-time either for spending money or just, you know, for seva is a much cleaner, clearer path to support your own yoga practice. And, but for me that the inherent conflicts and the, and the, and the murkiness of being an entrepreneur in the yoga space is actually really exciting and, and keeps me more engaged. I am not one for, (laughs) I'm like for my personality, the clean, clear path is not what makes me come alive. So you know, but I, I think it's a conversation that we don't have enough as yoga teachers. Like what's the priority here? Is it your practice? Is it your, your personal yoga practice? Well, if so, maybe being a yoga entrepreneur might not be the path for you. Um, but if you are like me and you, you don't like to take the easy path, if the rockier path is more, like that just feels more in my nature. <laughs> it, it, it actually does feed me more. It feeds my yoga more to be challenged in that way. Does that make sense? Yeah. And you just brought up a really great point. I think what I didn't know as a, as a new yoga teacher is I didn't understand how much my own personal practice would suffer once I became a yoga teacher. And I don't know if that was just me or, it was just so much harder to be, I couldn't be just in the student brain anymore. I couldn't, I I was thinking about how a class was put together and if I could remember poses. For- and you're not alone. That is a huge theme that I, that, that came up again and again and again in these hundred conversations. This is one of the things that yoga teachers around the world are thinking about and, and, and exploring and trying to solve, or, or I don't know if there's a solution for it, but we're interfacing with that, with that conflict and that challenge. Mm -hmm. I, the only solution that I can think of is, um, we talked to Kim Stark in an episode called too many yoga teachers. It's actually the I think it's right near the top of our most listened to episodes. And in that, what I the one gem that I gained was that if you want to take a yoga teacher training to strengthen your own personal practice, look for one that doesn't teach you how to teach, but instead really uh, goes deeper into a yoga teacher training. And there are a few out there, but not many. See, I think that's an awesome idea. And just knowing myself, I learn best through teaching. So right. if I were to take a training that didn't, you know, that didn't have the context of teaching, that didn't have me practice teaching, I wouldn't learn as much and I wouldn't be as engaged. Right. <laughs> it's so true. It's not a clear cut thing. Oh, you're right. Because that's a big part of any teacher training that I do as well. So that that felt like to you the most surprising. Were there any other surprising points? Uh, some some surprising points, and maybe I shouldn't be surprised, but I live in Asheville, North Carolina, which is a huge yoga yoga mecca, and we have tons of high quality yoga here. But a lot of people are not um, pleased with their yoga teacher training once they graduate. A lot of people feel kind of not ripped off exactly, but that the, that the training didn't deliver what was promised. And in a similar vein, I think these may be connected. I was also surprised by how many people who have only been teaching one or two or maybe three years are already teaching yoga teacher trainings or have like this really clear, um, sense that this is, that that's their next step that they want to teach yoga teacher trainings. I remember when I first graduated, it, it felt like there was um, more expectation that you needed to pay your dues as a teacher. And and I don't mean pay your dues as in like some kind of weird hierarchy. I mean more as in like you need to not be so green. You need to <laughs> get some seasoning on you before you teach yoga teacher trainings. And that, um, that doesn't seem to be, and again, maybe this is partially just from where I am 
um, you know, my location and my, the culture in my area. But I was surprised by those two things. What would you suggest to someone who's looking at taking a 200 hour before they take it? What, what would they do so that they, at the end, they feel like, ah, yeah, that was the right one. Um, don't choose it because of its location or its price. Uh Aha. That's really good (laughs) advice. Because you're like, oh, that one's right down the street. It'll be that that'll be the easiest for me. Right. Mm. Really um take take classes with the teachers, especially the lead teachers. And if you really want to do your research, talk to people who've graduated. Yeah. I would also say, you know, even though one day, yeah, I would say, you know, be cautious of a teacher training that hasn't been around very long. Okay. I think that's a great point as well. That someone, and you could ask, you know, how long have you been teaching and how many trainings have you led and, and how can I talk to some of your previous grads? I'm always happy to, to pass a few names along to someone or to say like, here are people who have taken the training. Anything else that you found out while talking with these yoga teachers that impacted you as a yoga teacher? Yeah, I I think one of the big things that impacted me was this recognition that as popular as yoga is, there's still a lot of um, misinformation about what yoga is with the general population that people are trying to teach. That as a yoga community, we can do better in educating the public because what's happened, I think, is that as yoga has become this billion dollar industry, we've allowed the big guys in the game, the marketing forces of these multinational corporations run by people who don't actually do yoga to define a lot of the conversation around yoga. And so people are left with this very shallow understanding of yoga And then these amazing, dedicated, passionate yoga teachers feel frustrated when they show up to classes and they're trying to teach these really deep teachings and people are just there to get a workout. And so I think that, that, you know, part of my mission is I want to help yoga teachers and the yoga community in general. I, I, I want us to market yoga better. I want us to do a better job of marketing yoga to the public for their own benefit. That's so Benevolent good. Benevolent marketing. <laughs> I just went to the Accessible Yoga Conference in Toronto last weekend, and they would love to hear you say that. Then I got in on the bus, and there was a woman who said to me, oh, you're a yoga teacher? I can't do yoga because it's very hard. You have to do all <laughs> kinds of very difficult poses. And I just thought, oh, my gosh, you're right. We're not doing a great job at marketing. And there's lots of space. I think one piece of that which gets me really excited is often I hear from yoga teachers, oh, well, I would I don't want to share videos because I'm too old or I'm too oh. large or I'm not bendy. And those are the videos that we need to be out there. Those are, or the photos or the the blog posts, you know, those are the those are the things that people need to see. You know, one of the conversations I had, that was a topic that came up. This woman was telling me, and this is a person that I have met personally. She's come to my yoga classes and she was like, well, I don't really look like a yoga, a yoga teacher. And I was like, and she's gorgeous. Mm-hmm. I mean, she's absolutely gorgeous. Not one thing wrong with her. She, she describes herself as curvy. I think she looks just like a, a woman, you know, she, I, she's not even, but this, this disconnect between how we feel on the inside versus how others see us. And I was like, if you won't put yourself out there, like if you feel that way about yourself, think about the, the person who truly is larger than the average person you know, like you're, she's still average, right? She's not rail thin. She's not, you know, she's not below average, but she's, she's, she's not a, a large person. Um, you know, I was like, gosh, we have to, we, we, especially people who don't present as that hyper mobile, <laughs> hi, like 20 something bendy tanned person. Those people really, we need those people out there representing yoga so that people recognize themselves and are willing to to take a step towards us. Yeah, it's so true. So in terms of 
how we can do that better. Do you have some ideas on that? Wow. I didn't think that we were going to get into this. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not there yet. I'm not sure yet. I want, one of the things I want to do is I want to help yoga teachers create new and new business models that allow them to go deeper with their students. Um, you know, and, and sometimes it's similar to what you're doing where I know you teach, um, series classes where people have to sign up in advance. It's on a specific topic and you don't, it, isn't the studio you teach at like a, like a collaborative studio where there's not a studio owner. Am I right about this? So you run your own. There's a studio, like there's someone who owns the building and now it's a rental space and you're right. It's a collaborative of yoga teachers, uh, it's an amazing place to teach. And then also we have, like my classes, we have a group of students who sign up and they they really bond as a community because it's 11 weeks that they're together. That's how long my my session is. Right. So, I mean, this is just kind of the infancy of my thought process around this, but I want to, I want us as yoga teachers to set the expectations for our students that they're going to make a bigger commitment to yoga because they're going to get more from it if they do that. If they only dip their toes in and attend these random public classes whenever they have an extra minute, they're, they're, they're not going to get deep. They're going to scratch the surface. So we need to train them to make a bigger commitment. We need to help them understand the mental, emotional, and spiritual benefits of yoga, which is easier to do when we're seeing them multiple times rather than just, you know, like randomly. Mm -hmm. And we need to train them to seek quality teachers in situations where in-depth training can occur. Right. So I don't have all the answers to how we do this. I think there's multiple ways. I think it's got to be a grassroots movement where each individual teacher, you know, kind of does that whole process of figuring out who their best in a position to best serve, to best connect with, and then connecting with them maybe in a similar fashion to my 100 Conversations project where they're reaching out to people. It does not have to be 100, obviously. The benefit of doing a big project like what I did is that you get a you get more comfortable with the conversations and you also get a bigger sample size. But you could definitely start with 5 or 10 or 20 and get to know like what your ideal students hopes and dreams and challenges are and you know figure out how that intersects with what you can offer them through yoga and then start talking about your yoga in that way this is a really good point because often if we're going and we're showing up to teach our group class you know there our students are maybe talking with each other maybe they come up at the beginning of the class and they just tell us something small but you're saying dig in and have some more conversations where you're researching like really what are their needs I feel like I I get to hear a lot of that when I do one-on-one -on -one with people but you're right that in in the group class setting uh, you know I just get that form and and then it's it's halfway through or near the end of the session before they start telling me what's what's kind of really going on. Yeah, exactly. It's hard, you know, when people come up to you, when you wait for them to come up to you, they're going to give you a much more edited version, partially because they don't want to bug you with their problems, you know, they're being respectful. But if you reach out to them and say, you know, especially if you say something like, you are... I mean, I don't play favorites, but you're one of my favorite students. I love having you in class. I just want to figure out how to attract more people like you. Right. <laughs> they're going to feel really good about that. And and they're going to open up to you. And, you know, if you have a one-on-one, -on -one more in-depth conversation, then you can learn a lot more about them than they, they might not think it's relevant to you, but you know it's relevant. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a really good point. And so what other things did you learn in talking to all of these yoga teachers? Um, you know, I, <laughs> this is this is not really new, but it's like a, a, a deepening and a and a more more and more visceral understanding of how much yoga teachers care. We care so much, so deeply about our students and their well-being and their growth. And yoga teachers also put a lot of pressure on themselves to perform, to show up with an inspiring 
and uh, an inspiring class that challenges every student, meets every student where they are <laughs> in it, like in just the, you know what I'm saying? We put a lot of pressure on ourselves. One of the things that I feel a, not an obligation, but kind of inspired to do with my podcast is to help yoga teachers kind of take off some of that burden because sometimes I think what we ask of ourselves isn't, isn't possible and our students aren't expecting it of us. Right. This perfection, like I'm going to show up and be perfect and, and teach to everyone in this room. (laughs) Yeah. And I'm going to be inspiring every single time. Right. It sounds ridiculous when you say that, but I know what it feels like to plan to do that. I think you know, one of the, one of the pieces that's kind of coming together for me is that this drop in class, um, environment leads to that because you're not developing, um, a a trust relationship and you're, you like every time there might be somebody new there that you need to hook in to come back. You need to convince them and motivate them to come back because your class was so good versus a series where they sign up and they commit for a while. And then, you know, they've had some of those deep experiences with you and they're not expecting you to to like deliver that every single time. You're making me think of, I signed up for a drumming circle. Uh, My kids and I signed up, my two younger ones, and it was kind of our night out. And you're right, it never would have worked as a drop-in. First of all, we would have gone the first night, learned a few things. Oh, that was fun. You know, it was the going, meeting different people in the community, working on something together, creating something together and learning as we went until it was like the final, you know, finale when we all played together and it was something really fantastic. Not that, not that we're making our yoga students do a performance, but you're right. We really build, built relationships. And sometimes our lead teacher in the drumming was really open that she was having a very tough day and and she was going to, you know, get someone else to step in for a bit or or could we just, you know, kind of hold space for her that she it was just an off day. Yeah. Wow, that's that's a great a great parallel, Shannon, because you know, you wouldn't really in a in a drop in class, it would be much harder to share that kind of thing with, you know, especially if it's a large class and you have a bunch of new people, it would, it would feel like, well, is this the first impression I want to give them of me? (laughs) Right. Exactly. Exactly. Huh. I wonder if it's just because you and I love registered sessions. Do you teach drop in right now? I do. Yeah. I don't love it. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I, I think there's a reason that we love registered sessions. I, 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 you know, I think we're both about going deep, right? We're both about like creating actual change for our students and drop in does not facilitate that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And for all the teachers listening who teach drop in, you know, I used to do that as well. And I didn't really know what the pushback was for years (laughs) until I just tried it. I was like, you know what? It's summer. My numbers are dropping. I'm going to run a special summer registered session. And that was it. I didn't go back. (laughs) Um, Anything else that you can think of that really popped out at you doing this 100 conversations? Um. I'm, I'm trying I mean, there's so much, honestly, Shannon, we could, we could probably like go on and on and on, but I feel like that, that covers sort of the, the most, uh, potent, most potent pieces have, have been at least touched on. And I guess, okay, I guess one final thing is this, there's a little bit of a, an interesting, um, struggle, not, not a struggle, but there's tension in the, in the relationship when there's this triad of yoga studio owner, yoga teacher, and yoga student. Because a lot of times the interests of the yoga teacher and the interests of the yoga studio owner are not, um, they're not the same. You know, there's, there's some tension and conflict between that. And so, for example, for yoga studio owners, they do not want people niched. They want people to be able to teach a lot of different types of classes. And they also, you know, the drop-in benefits them because they want more bodies overall in the building, right? Instead of 
the, you know, for their bottom line, um, the depth of a relationship with one teacher, they don't mostly see a strong connection to their bottom line. And I just, you know, I want to put this out there because I don't want yoga studio owners to feel like I have any sort of, um, (laughs) judgment towards them. I actually have a ton of admiration because they're in a really tough position. The, the yoga studio business model is an incredibly tough business. It's so stressful. There are so many balls in the air. I know that you know a little bit about that, Shannon. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think it's important to validate them and and that they are totally doing their best. But the situation um, is is not always... Th- there's tension. There's tension there. And it's not always going to lead to the best outcome for the students. And that's... you know, I, I think any good business, and especially a helping business, we got to start with the, the recipients in this case, it's our students, our yoga students, that everything that we do has to, or it doesn't have to, but I think that the best case scenario, we are looking at their growth and what's best for them. And then we're figuring out how, how to make things, um, that are sustainable for us that still put that growth as primary. Right. I like this perspective on it. Oftentimes, I think that we might be thinking, oh, what can my yoga student afford? What works with their schedule? What? And you're saying, okay, let's look at their growth and what would really help and benefit our yoga students first. And I think then once they're seeing the benefit of it, they, you know, they, they can see the value in it as well. I know a guy who doesn't have a car because he, I mean, this is just his value system, right? He does not have a car. He walks everywhere. He takes public transport, but he has a yoga studio membership. Oh yeah, for sure. Right. This is his priority. And we, we, all of us in our lives, in our lives do this mostly kind of subconsciously, but we make money for what's important to us, what we really find valuable. Mm -hmm. That's very, very true. Huh. That's given me lots to think on for sure. I love that you took this and I'm sure that it also informs your podcast now in terms of the struggles that you know yoga teachers are facing. Yeah. Well, you know, that final question that I was asking people, it morphed. Once I started the podcast, I just started asking them directly, what would you like to see on the podcast? What would you like to me to focus on? And so I got ton of, of insight, both from asking indirectly and from asking directly. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's so good. People always ask me, Oh, how, how do you come up with the content of the podcast? I'm like, it's from all of your questions that you keep asking, especially in the connected yoga teacher group or in emails. I mean, I feel like I can't, I can't keep up with the questions. So I like that between you and I and the other podcasts that are out there, we can we can start to answer some of those questions for yoga teachers and really help them. Yeah, coming up with content is not a problem. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's the time to put it together. That's for sure. And that's how you know I think that you're in the right space mm-hmm. is when you don't have any trouble coming up with content. When that's the least of your worries, then you know you're in the right place. Yeah. <laughs> It's so true. Well, this has been such a pleasure to talk with you. If people want to listen to the podcast or get that 100 yoga class themes download, what website do they go to? Teachingyoga.net. Super simple. Just teachingyoga.net. We will put a link in the show notes. Thank you so much for your time today. This has been fantastic. Thank you so much, Shannon, for having me on. I really, I had a blast and you're an amazing interviewer. Thank you. Alrighty, Connected Yoga Teachers. How are you feeling now after hearing from Mado? Thank you so much, Mado, for taking on this huge project and then sharing that with us today. I want to know, what is the one thing that really stuck with you after today's episode? What challenged you or made you think differently or what might you try now that you heard this chat with Mado? One thing that Mado stressed is the importance of taking classes or workshops with a teacher before signing up for their yoga teacher training. This is amazing advice. 
along with also reaching out and talking with other people who have graduated from a teacher training with that person. And another key takeaway for me here was that we could all do a project like Mido if we're looking to create content that we want to offer to an audience and we want to increase that connection with our audience. So we need to be hearing from real people in some capacity to develop something that will connect with them. Let me share a personal example. In the Connected Yoga Teacher group, so many of you are asking amazing questions. And that is how I hear the struggles and the challenges that you are facing. And that is how I create the content that I have. That's how we come up with the podcast topics, courses, articles, All of our content is fueled by the one-on-one conversations that I have in that Facebook group and also weekly with yoga teachers. So I talk with yoga teachers every Thursday in consultation calls. As Mado and I said, there is really this huge, (laughs) vast ocean of content that we see when we're connected to yoga teachers, when we're talking to yoga teachers. So I want to flip that around a little bit here for those of you who your ideal audience is not a yoga teacher. If it's a yoga student, how can you do this as a yoga teacher? So take the same example. Maybe we can't talk with a hundred yoga students, but say, for example, if you want to teach to beginner yoga students, then your people that you need to talk with probably have never done yoga before, but maybe they're interested in doing yoga. So what would it look like if you plan to do maybe five conversations, maybe 10 conversations with people who are your ideal yoga student? I want to hear about that if you take that project on. And if you're wondering, well, how can I do that? You know what? A really simple thing is just to ask. So you could put it out on Facebook. You can ask friends. You can say, hey, I'm looking to talk with five people who might even be reluctant to try yoga. Do you have a friend who's never done yoga or do you have a friend who's dealing with this particular issue? Those are the people I want to talk with. And maybe you want to niche down and specialize, but you don't have the confidence yet to do so. Talking with people and asking them to share what they are facing or what their challenges are is another way that you can create the content for that ideal yoga retreat, workshop, class, so that it's created for that group of people. So another example, think of a really super busy new mom and she's, you know, always taking care of kids. Let's talk to those new moms and say, you know, what do you need in a yoga class? Do you want to move around a lot or do you want to lay down or do you want a combination of both? Like, let's talk to enough new moms so that we can figure out what are their biggest struggles that they're facing. And if you want to get into the mindset of a new mom, I covered that last week in episode 90, where I went through what it felt like for me as a new mom uh, in terms of what our postnatal or baby and me classes, who that ideal student is and what they're dealing with. Okay, connected yoga teachers, I want to know what actionable step could you take today with anything that caught your eye here today in our conversation with Mado? I would love to hear about it either in the show notes or in our Facebook group. And if you have any questions at all, make sure to post in there. If you'd like to work one-on-one with either Mado or myself, I will put links in the show notes. So Mado is teachingyoga.net slash coaching. And then mine is the connectedyogateacher.com slash consultations. But the links are there for you. So no need to worry and write those down really fast. If you want to meet up in person, well, this will be after I come out of winter hibernation. So we're getting right close to December. Our winters here up on the Bruce Peninsula in Ontario involves a lot of snow. So cross-country skiing is really good, but then we also have closed roads and snow days. For example, last year there were 13 snow days, I think, for the kids. So I will not be traveling around in the winter. 
but I am coming out of hibernation for the Toronto Yoga Show. That's the first time that I'm really planning to get out there and see yoga teachers in person outside of my small community. And I'm actually really excited about that because I'll be there talking with yoga teachers. So let me know if you're going. It's March 29th to the 31st. That's in 2019 in Toronto, Ontario. Yes, that's in Canada. And also, I'm teaching an 85-hour Mama Nurture prenatal yoga teacher training in two locations. One is Bermuda from April 15th to 16th. And then the other one is in Meaford, Ontario, Canada, starting April 26th. And it goes April, May, and June. We go over three months with that one. I'm also teaching an in-person yoga for pelvic health, 20-hour yoga teacher training, but that's not until next November, 2019, November 2nd and 3rd in Meaford, Ontario. But I want to tell you because those spots fill up very quickly. Also, if you're like me and you like to hibernate, we have many online trainings and courses, so make sure to check them out. Today's episode is possible because we have an amazing team over here. Thank you, Samantha, Suzanne, and Crunch. Okay, Connected Yoga teachers, it's time for me to sign off. I want to know what will you be doing this week to stay connected to yourself, your yoga practice, and to your community. Take care. <laughs>